number four, verse one. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priests' feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Verse number 4. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribe of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children come, uh, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Verse 7. Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it uh, passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So we find in this passage, Joshua, who has led the children of Israel across, or he's about to lead them across the Jordan River, and we find that uh, Joshua has been told by the Lord to have every man, a person from every tribe of the children of Israel, to pick up a stone and to carry it across the sea or across the river. And uh, they're going to pick up a stone. Notice uh, in the verse there, it says, where the, feet, where the priest's feet stood firm. I like that phrase. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. But let me just point out, as I begin to think about this, Jesus is our priest. You know what I began to think about? Uh, Hebrews chapter number 8, verses 1 and 2 tells us that Jesus is our high priest. And Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 11 tells us this as well. And I began to think about this, and, and I began to, to think if we follow Him, we will be on solid ground. Amen. The problem that arises with our lives is when we stop following Christ, and we start going our own direction. Right. We need to remember that we need to follow Christ, uh, and we will be on firm ground. Psalm chapter 37, verse number uh, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so we find here that if we only would follow Christ, we would be on firm foundation. Because the Bible says, On Christ the solid rock I stand. Jesus, uh, yesterday, let me start this by saying, Yesterday, went out to uh, Nettle Carrier Creek. And uh, I put to practice Joshua chapter number 4. I didn't have 12 men of Israel with me, so it was just me and my son that helped me. Uh, and we went out, and I took the girls with us too, but we went on a little hike down the creek. Found some uh, rocks, uh, 12 to be exact, to stick with uh, our scripture passage this morning. And we found some rocks that we could use to do what Joshua talks about, or what God had told Joshua to do. I want to talk this morning about the idea of remembering, the uh, rocks of remembrance. See, this is the whole reason why they were told to grab these rocks and to carry them. Now, these are probably not as big as what some of these men would carry across. Uh, but <laughs> there where we live, there at Carrier Creek, to go down is about like this. And so to carry them up, it's like this, and so I had to find some smaller rocks to carry out. I had a good time. One thing I found out, though, is if you are on a dry rock, you're okay, but as soon as you get on a wet rock, it becomes very slippery. You know what I thought about? I began to think the miracle of Jesus, uh, of God, parting the Red Sea and parting the Jordan, and they went across on what? Dry ground. That means there wasn't a bit of water in the sand or the rocks that they crossed over on. Wow. Now I tell you, there in Nettle Carrier Creek, there by where I live at, there's water, some water running down. You can walk on some of the rocks, but even where there's not a water running real, it still splashes up on some of the rocks, and there's still wet rocks. But we think of this, this parting of the Red Sea. They didn't, 
or, or the Jordan, they didn't go across on muddy ground. They didn't have to go, careful, there's a slippery stone here. I found one of those stones yesterday and broke one of them. Okay, let me say this, never go to a creek in flip-flops. <laughs> Not a good idea. Yeah, I, I lost one of mine, okay, uh, yesterday. And, uh, but they didn't have to go, watch your steps here, watch out. They didn't do that because God, when He split the Red Sea, when He divided the Jordan River, made everything dry. Right. See, these you can walk on today. They're, they're dry. They're a firm foundation. There's no mud. They're not slippery. There's not going to be any falling. And see, if we follow Christ, we're going to find that He's always on dry, solid ground. And if you follow Christ, there's not going to be any muddy places. There's not going to be any falling and slippery and sliding. No, it's when we get off of the trail, when we start getting off the narrow way, as the Bible puts it, we begin to fall, we begin to slip, we begin to slide. But I want us to think about 12 things. I did not put these in specific order, but 12 things of remembrance and uh, 12 stones in our own lives that we can place just to remember when we get in a difficult time. The last part of our passage says the children will come and they're going to ask, why are these stones here? They're going to, the parents are going to tell them because of all the great things that God's done. And because how He split the Jordan and how we, He delivered us and all these different things. So there ought to be something in our lives that we can look back to. I think memorials are important to have. And in our own lives, set those down. Even if it has to be something uh, solid and physical to remind you of something spiritual, that's okay. What we find here, we use the stones in particular... Number one, the first stone that I looked at, I want to use it. Of course, we know Jesus is the foundation. Okay, we're not going to get into that now because I'm going to preach on that later. But we know Jesus is the foundation. But these stones aren't in particular order. But I would like to begin with this one. And that is the foundation of realizing that God is good. God is good. He's good all the time. You know, Psalm chapter number 34, verses 4 through 8. The psalmist writes, I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. It says, they looked uh, unto Him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, the Bible says, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord is, uh, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him and delivereth them. And then verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. You see, we have a good God. Amen. See, when we try to put ourselves as God, we're not good. This world is not good. But when we trust in God, we're trusting in a good God. He said, but I'm going through some difficult times. Remember that your God is good. Amen. I'm facing some battles. Remember that your God is a good God. Amen. It's a solid stone. Amen. A rock of remembrance that we need to put in our lives. And remember when Satan attacks that God is good. When he begins to attack us with our doubts or questions or worries. Remember that God is good. Amen. That's our first rock of remembrance. The next one. Because of 12 I'm just giving an overview of each one of these. The next one I'd like to point out, I have it sitting here as well, and that is that uh, God has great power. Right. See, God is good, but He has great power. Amen. See, what, what, is, what is our power? Not much. Nothing. See, I, I remember I had, we were carrying these rocks up out of the creek yesterday, especially this one here, God's goodness. Uh, I was like, Corbin? No, I didn't do this one to him. I carried this one up myself. He couldn't carry it. But what I had him do is I had him stand halfway up, and I'd take these rocks, and I'd... Ugh, I think that's what I did. Mom, I'll tell you, I was sore this morning. That's probably what I did. I probably did this one too many times. Uh, but I threw him up there, and Corbin picked him up. And we're carrying him, and he goes, Oh, it's so heavy. I mean, after carrying it 11 rocks, you know, it gets pretty heavy. This is heavy. This is heavy. And I grabbed a couple of them and carried him up. A lot of times our burdens are like these rocks here. They get heavy for us. Uh, and we just need God to come along and pick them up for us. Man. See, in our power, we have nothing. In our strength. Right. But God has great power. Amen. He has great power for salvation of the soul. 
He saves us from death, hell, and the grave. Yeah. And I'm thankful that God has power. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. And He is God. And I'm thankful that God has this power. I think of John chapter number 8 this morning. John chapter number 8, verses 34 through 36. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say to you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in that house forever, but the son abideth ever. Verse 36 says this, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So many times people try to free themselves from the bondage of sin. You can't do it. You don't have the power to do it. You can't overcome your sin. So many times people try to kick a bad habit or try to, uh, or try to uh, flee and, and to do the things that they think they ought to. You and yourself do not have the power. This is why you go to God, Amen. who has all power. Yes. For those who are lost and undone, they say, well, if I'm good enough, I have the power to be able to save myself, and I hope the scale just goes on the good side. I've heard that before. I hope the scale tips towards the good side, I'll be okay. It won't happen. Because your good works are filthy rags. Uh, so you don't have to put your good works away. You don't have the power to save yourself. I don't care how nice you are, I don't care how clean you are, I don't care how, how friendly you are, or how nice you look, or what you do, or the good deeds that you do, or the charities you help. It doesn't make a difference. You don't have the power. When you rely on your power, you're relying on the wrong power. You will fall short. But God has power to save your soul. And maybe somebody who's lost and undone, you need to receive the power of God to save your soul. Repent of your sins and turn to God. He can save your soul. But Christians, not only that, but He has power for our trials. Yeah. When we go through our trials in life, He has power to help us. I like what 2 Samuel chapter 22, if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn over there with me. 2 Samuel chapter number 22. This is actually uh, a Psalm of David that you can find in Psalm chapter 18, but it's worded just a little bit different in 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22, starting at verse 1, says that David spake unto the Lord words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies. God had the strength to deliver David. David didn't have the strength to do it himself. God delivered David. And God can deliver you out of your trials. Out of the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock. And my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, in Him will I trust. I will not trust. He says, I'm not trusting in what I can do. I'm trusting the one who gave me the power and the victory and the deliverance of my enemies. Amen. That's the one I trust in. Says, He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call the name. I will call the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Amen. It is God's power that has the power to help you in your times of trial. It is God who will give you the strength when you're going through a difficult time to give you the power to make it through that time that you're Amen. facing. It is God's strength, God's power. Do not try to make it in your own power. You need to have the rock of remembrance of God's power that He has. Not only this, but I look and I think of God's, uh, God's grace. God's grace is amazing grace. And I think God's grace is a great thing that we need to build and remember of God's grace. One thing about God's grace, and this is something we can preach on for weeks and weeks, but I'm not going to take the time to. But I want you to take your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number uh, 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. And we're going to find that God's grace is sufficient. Amen. God's grace is sufficient. Amen. And we're over now, turning over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 this morning. I want you to see what David, or what uh, Paul, excuse me, writes to the church of Corinth here. As we talk about these rocks of remembrance, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. And I want us to start reading at verse number 7. Paul says, And 
lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, in verse number 9, My grace is sufficient for thee. You say, I have something in my life that I want out. I want to get rid of it. I want to get out from underneath it. God's grace is sufficient for you. Even in your trial, even in the circumstances you face, you say, but I pray and ask God to deliver me from it. But it may be God's will that you still have that. It was God's will for Paul to have his thorn in his flesh. It kept him humble. So many times we get in difficult situations. What's one of the first things we do? We try to run. Instead, we ought to look for God's power and His grace because it's sufficient for us. Notice here, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul writes, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What are your infirmities that you have? Paul says, I'd rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, the things that make me weak. I'm going to realize that those are the things that God can use in a much mightier way than I could ever imagine. This is God's power. Verse number 10, notice what he says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. You don't understand what I'm facing. That's in a very stressful time. Paul says, I take pleasure in those because God's grace is sufficient for me. Amen. For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. We say, I want to muscle my way through this. I want to make myself do what I need to do. No. You let God's grace help you. His grace is sufficient. Oh, but Romans chapter number 5. Romans 5 tells us that God's grace is greater. Romans chapter number 5. Starting at verse number 17. Here we find in Romans chapter 5, verse number 17. For by, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, the Bible says, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That offense is by Adam, by the way. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that is Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Verse 19. Amen. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offenses might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Love that verse. Amen. Verse 21. Amen. That as sin hath reigned into death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You say, you don't know the things I've done in my life. God's grace is Right. You don't understand the things that I've faced. You don't understand the circumstances that I have. God's grace is greater Amen. than all our sin. Amen. Grace, grace. God's grace is amazing. Amen. What a great loving God that we have. But not only God's grace, may to put that as a rock of remembrance. But may I add God's great love. Yeah. Boy, God loved us so much. Romans chapter 8 tells us that nothing is able to separate thee from God's love. Amen. Nothing. Right. Romans chapter 8, verses, starting at verse 39. Who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are become more than conquerors through Christ loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, 
nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. When you're in a place you don't feel love, remember God has great love for you, and nothing Amen. can separate you from Amen. God's love. Amen. You say, I'm in a dark place in my life. God's love is there. God. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Amen. God's love is shown to us on the cross. Romans chapter 5. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man, so even dare to die. Everybody knows verse saying, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. You say, How much does God love me? He sent his son to die for our sins. Amen. He sent his son to be our propitiation. He sent his son to justify us. That's God's great love. Amen. It's proven on the cross. Amen. You say, nobody loves me. People may say, nobody loves me. They don't care for me. God does. God. You, there is a loving Heavenly Father out there that wants you, that cares for you. God's love rocked at remembrance. But I also, as I began to think and ponder, I think of God's promises in His Word. God's promises in His Word ought to be a rock of remembrance. We ought to remember the promises that God has made to us. We ought to remember the great love that God has for us and His Amen. promises. 2 Peter, take a bow to 2 Peter chapter 1. Amen. The Bible tells us that they're precious. Yes. And I have my, I'm using the Bible, but I, I haven't written all my notes here for not having to do too many, but I do have my Bible here. I am using 2 Peter chapter number 2, or chapter number 1, starting at verse 1. Amen. I want you to see here how great the promises of God are. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Notice verse 4. Whereby, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. God's promises are precious. Why? Because they're perfect. They're pure. And you can count on them every time. Amen. Amen. They're precious. You say, how do I know Jesus will save me if I ask Him to come to my heart? He promised. Amen. Christian, how do I know that God will lift me out of my trials? Because He promised. Amen. How do I know that Jesus will come back and take me to heaven? Because He promised. Amen. And His promises are found in His Word. But they're also powerful. They're not just precious, but they're powerful. Keep reading in verse 4. Notice about these promises... That by these, that's the promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The promises of God, when you learn them and you meditate on them, make them a rock of remembrance, they have the power to deliver you from the corruption that is in the world. Amen. Amen. That's the promises of God. They'll give you strength. They'll give you victory. They'll help you. The promises of God. Not only this, but I think of God's Word. God's Word ought to be a rock of remembrance for us. Yes. It's important that we have God's Word as a rock of remembrance in our lives. Take time to learn God's Word. The Bible tells in John 17, 7, Sanctify them through thy Word. Thy Word is truth. Amen. You see, there is no truth. People claim there is no truth. There is. It's yes, the Word sir. of God. Amen. There is absolute truth. Amen. It's found in God's Word. Amen. Amen. Thy word is truth. Right. We ought to make God's word a rock of remembrance. How can we do that? Meditate on God's word day and night. Amen. Let it sink into your heart. Let it become a rock of remembrance for you. Right. Nothing else will help you better than God's word in, you, in your times of need. Amen. In your times of decision. It's in God's word. Right. When you need to decide what, which way to go, what decision to make, what's right and what's wrong, find it in God's word. Amen. It's truth. But God's Word is not only just the truth, it also shows us the way to heaven. Jesus Himself told the Pharisees, search, search the Scriptures, for in them think ye, uh, ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. They tell of Jesus. Amen. That's right. 
He said, well, hey, no, Jesus is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father, but by me. The Bible, the Word, shows us the way to heaven. Yes. This is it. The Word. The rock of remembrance. Not only this, but we ought to remember God's holiness. God's holiness ought to be a rock of remembrance for us. It ought to be a rock of remembrance. See, God's holiness, or holiness in and of itself, is a beautiful thing. God thinks it's beautiful. Do you know that? God thinks that holiness is a beautiful thing. Uh, yes. Take your Bibles and turn them over to Psalm chapter 29. Psalm chapter number 29. I want you to see this. See, the world thinks holiness is not beautiful. They think worldliness is beautiful. Worldliness is a stench. It's a holy lifestyle, a holy talk, a holy walk that is beautiful. Amen. People say, well, what will make me beautiful in this life? Be holy. Amen. Be holy. Amen. Well, I want to look good. Be holy. Be holy. It will separate you, but you'll look good to God. Amen. Psalm 29, verses number 1 and 2. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Notice, verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord, how? In the beauty of holiness. Amen. Holiness is a beautiful thing. Amen. Are you holy? Are you trying to live a holy life? Are you becoming a little more holy each day? Are you becoming a little more like Christ each step that you take? We ought to be. It's a beautiful thing. Nothing can be more beautiful than God in holiness. Because He is holy. Holiness is beautiful to God because He Himself is holy and He expects us to be. Leviticus chapter, third, uh, chapter 20 verse 7 says, Sanctify uh, yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I am holy uh, for I am the Lord your God. Peter reassured us of this as he said in 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 and 16, whatever he said, but as he which hath called you is holy, that's God, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. In all manner of conversation. That's not just in your lips. That's all manner. That is everything. This would include the way you talk, the way you look. What you listen to, what you watch, what you do on the computer, what you uh, what you do whenever your teacher's back is turned, what you do when your boss's back is turned, all manner. Are you holy? He said, uh, because it is written, referring back to Leviticus, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy. That's not a suggestion, people. Amen. We're to be holy. Uh, Separated. Holy to God. But let me quickly move on and look at God's great glory. God's glory. A rock of remembrance. He has great glory. Psalm chapter number 19 tells us in verse number 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. You see, yeah. God is worthy of glory and His creation glorifies Him. Right. His heaven declares His glory. Yeah. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day to day utter speech and not in the night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. God's glory is proclaimed to the entire world. Their light has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle before the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit to the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. God's heavens declare his glory. Amen. You say, I don't see God's glory. Look up in the sky. Amen. Look up in the sky. Last night we were we had to run to town. I loaded all the kids up. We went to the creek. It was just down the street where we lived, just by grace there. And uh, so we just took the truck 
I mean, just loaded the kids up. They sat in the back with me, and uh, all they drove, and I was there with the kids. Took them down to the creek, uh, did some stuff, and came back up. And I said, I've got to go to the store. So we put all the kids in the truck, and I sat in the back of the truck because I was not going to get in there. I just smelled the way I smelled them. <laughs> just, I wasn't going to go there. All right, so I'm in the back of the truck. All right, we go down to Walgreens, all the way down to Walgreens, the other side of town. Driving through down, here I am. I'm like, gosh, where my pastor Polo? Hey, guys, come to church, you know. I had all this gunk all over me uh, from slipping and falling in the creek. But uh, we go to Walgreens, we come back. And by this time, I'm thinking, well, Holly got this little, she got two packages of diapers, what she did. They make good pillows. So I said, let me see those. So I put them in the back of the truck, and I laid down. You know what I did? I looked up. You know what I saw? God's glory. Amen. I saw the stars. I saw the trees. I saw God's glory. You see, I want to see God's glory. Just look up. It's there. His heavens declare it. Not only this, but in Revelation chapter 4, the elders in heaven declare God's glory. Amen. Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him, that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. O God is worthy of glory, and he receives it by the heavens and by the elders. And by the way, let me just say that we ought to give God glory as well. Amen. Also, God's mercy. A rock of remembrance. We've got to make God's mercy a rock of remembrance. We remember God's mercy. See, God's mercy is new every morning. Amen. You say, I fell awfully bad yesterday, but His mercy is new today. Yes. That's right. I fell awfully bad last night, but His mercy is new every night Amen. or every morning. Molly, said, Molly told me, she goes, I think God's mercies are new every morning because we need them every morning when we first start. We don't need them always at night. In the morning, we've already messed up. But His mercy is new every morning. Right, you need Him. Right, That's in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, by the way. You can find that. Yeah. Not only this, but the Bible tells us that His mercies endure forever. Yeah. Well, you can find so many passages about this, about God's mercy going from generation to generation, passed down forever and ever. 1 Chronicles 16, 34, I'll give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. His mercy He's not going to run out of His mercy. Amen. It endures forever. He's saying, but I don't know if there's enough mercy for me. There is. Amen. There's mercy. Right. That's why we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace because God has the mercy. Right. He'll give it to you. Now, God's great commission, church, rock of remembrance. This is one we always forget. We tend to forget this. God gave us a great commission. Right. Going into all the world and preaching off to every creature. We have a job to do. Right. And it is best that we remember that we're supposed to do. That we need to do it. Right. We need to remember God's great commission. There's a job for us to do. And we must finish the job. Paul wrote this. Whenever he said, I have finished my course. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. We need to go out and do what we're to do. But let me also quickly add our position. Rock of remembrance. Our position thanks to Jesus Christ. You know, Christ gives us a position. You know that? Because of who He is, because of what He's done, He has given us a position. Yes. We're ambassadors. No. You represent Heaven. No. People say, well, I don't see Jesus anywhere. They ought to in you. No. They ought to in me. You're an ambassador. What does an ambassador do? They represent the country they're from. Amen. And the interests of it. Right. See, this world is not my home. I am, I'm an ambassador of my own heaven. Right. Are you? If you're, if you're a Christian, you are. The question is, what kind of ambassador are you? Because you say, I'm a Christian. You live like the devil in the world. You're a bad ambassador. Amen. And we forget this. We have the position of being an ambassador. Right. That'll be a rock of remembrance. Remember who you are. Remember the position God's given you. We're ambassadors. Romans chapter number 8, we'll take time to read it. But Romans 8, verses 12 to 17 tells us that we are joint heirs with Christ. Amen. He makes us joint heirs with who He is. What is Christ's is ours. Not because we deserve it, but because God's just that good.
Jesus is that good. Amen. Amen. And finally, let me add our promised land. See, God's promised us a land it's called heaven. Uh, it's beyond compare. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, but the Bible says, not that half has been told. Uh, I think of Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2, where Jesus is, uh, where John has the revelation of heaven, and he says in verse number 2 that uh, it is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Nothing more beautiful that could ever compare to a bride adorned for that wedding day for her husband. Amen. The hours and the hours that is spent on a bride getting ready for that time to walk down the aisle to look her best for her husband. And that's what Jerusalem is. That's what the new Jerusalem, the new heaven is. Amen. Nothing can compare to that. And it's a place of joy. That same passage there in Revelation 21 talking about Jesus wiping away our tears from our eyes. There will be no more sickness, no more sorrows, no more griefs. He says, I am out and obey the beginning and the end. He is the one that will give us these things. The question is, what is, do you have a place of remembrance? We need to take our rocks, follow the rock, and make rocks of remembrance out of them. So many things that we could, you could add to this, I know. Not near enough of what I've gone over. But you could take it. You may have thought of something else that you need to put in as a rock of remembrance. Maybe a specific time that God has blessed you, that God has helped you, that God has delivered you. Say, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to remember that. Amen. And make that a rock of remembrance. These are just 12 general ideas. See, remembering is going to help us know that God has already done great things. Yeah. So we know He can. Yeah. And it's going to help us to know that God is capable of great things. Because yeah. He's proven it. Ah. And we remember the past, it gives us hope for the future. Because we remember how great God is. Yeah. So when you go through another difficult time, you remember how great your God is. Yeah. We should remember the past with thankfulness. Serve God now with humility. And look forward to what God is going to do with great anticipation and excitement. Ah. That's what we ought to be doing. Yeah. Rocks of remembrance. We need to put them in our lives. Uh, Bye, you guys. Close your eyes this morning. Nobody looking around.